Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and although it's the end of a long day at the JPC, I want to take a couple of minutes to show you a great case with some wonderful lesions that cross my desk today. This particular case is from a 12-month-old Angus calf from a ranch which had recently undergone a loss of 60 animals following exposure to toxic levels of menensin in early January. Before we look at these great lesions, let's talk a little bit about menensin. Menensin is a commonly used feed additive in cattle, livestock, and poultry because it not only is a coccidiostat, but in ruminants also increases feed efficiency due to its ability to increase the production of propionic acid in the rumen. Unfortunately, at high doses, it causes some problems. In the coccidia, it causes a disruption of the sodium-potassium transport mechanisms, and coccidians will absorb water and essentially explode. And it can do the same thing in mammalian cells at high levels. But even more importantly, when you disrupt that cellular membrane, which handles sodium and potassium transport, it also allows calcium to get into the cell. And in the heart and the skeletal muscle, this can be devastating because calcium will not only get into the mitochondria and poison them, but also excessive levels of calcium in the cytoplasm of muscle cells will cause those actin and myosin fibers to crawl across each other and cause massive hypercontraction. Normally, the cell will take the calcium back up and put it in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But when there's so much calcium in the cytosol, it cannot do that. Muscle cells, both in the heart and the skeletal muscle, will go into hypercontraction, leading to necrosis. Other changes that you might see in affected animals would be hyperkalemia due to release of potassium from the injured cells, as well as hyponatremia. The heart is particularly susceptible to disruption of its cellular physiology due to its high energy requirements, and decreasing the mitochondrial efficiency can have de devastating effects. Monensin is most severe in monogastrics, but we also see lesions in cattle as well. So let's take a look at these slides. Here we have three sections of myocardium. I'm not sure exactly where they are from because all we got were pieces of the heart. At low magnification, it doesn't look too bad. But if we key in and go to slightly higher magnification, you will see areas of pallor separating the myofibers. And at high magnification, you'll see that the myofibers are in these areas lost. Some are swollen and vacuolated, and a few remain as atrophic myofibers. Now, this doesn't look like such a severe lesion, does it? But as we travel around, you'll see that there are significant parts of the heart which are affected in here. Just about anywhere we go, we'll see these areas of fibrosis and myofiber loss. Now, if you really want to get a good feel for how much of the myocardium is actually lost, Best thing to do is to put a Masson's trichrome on the stain, which will highlight the collagen, which will turn it blue against the normal red of intact myofibers. Now those areas of myofiber loss really jump out at us, and we can see that maybe up to 20% of the myocardium is lost and replaced with fibrous connective tissue which is not only non-contractile, so this animal will go into heart failure, but any of these could serve 
as a focus for the generation of a cardiac dysrhythmia, especially in a hyperkalemic animal. So this animal may be in heart failure. Well, how do we confirm that based on just looking at biopsies without a chance to look at the animal clinically? Let's go back to a second section. We have heart, diaphragm, and this piece of tissue with the reticular pattern is actually the liver. And this is a fantastic lesion, which our Masanza is going to help us look at in a minute. If you look, there is a network of pink with hemorrhage scattered through the entire section. And these are the central lobular areas of the liver. The patocytes of the central lobular areas of the liver live on the razor's edge of hypoxia. And when you change, they are the last cells in the entire body to get oxygenated. And when you change the oxygen content of the blood, like you have an animal in heart failure, it is enough to push them over the edge. They will become necrotic very quickly. They will disassociate and they will float off down the central veins. And we're looking at a network of bridging central lobular necrosis throughout the entire section. Here's central vein here, and everywhere its tributaries are is an area of necrosis. You can see the hemorrhage. Now, adjacent to that in the mid-zonal areas, we have wonderful vacuolation and lipid accumulation. Now, these hepatocytes aren't quite dead, but they're certainly sick. And one of the characteristics of sick hepatocytes is the inability to get rid of fat, and it accumulates. Okay, it takes energy to complex it with protein, re-excrete from the cell, but it takes no energy to get it in. So a sick hepatocyte is a hepatocyte that has lipid vacuoles, and we can see that the mid-zonal cells are all sick. The cells that look pretty good, we'll back out again, are the periportal hepatocytes. And the periportal hepatocytes are A, not on the razor's edge of hypoxia. They get a little bit more oxygen because the blood supply comes in from the portal areas, percolates all the way through to the central lobular area. So they get a little more oxygen. The other thing that differ, differentiates periportal hepatocytes from central lobular hepatocytes is they don't have a lot of the cytochrome P450 oxidases. They do not metabolize drugs. And with drugs like menensin, metabolites can be the most toxic. So in these cases, these periportal hepatocytes are generally pretty safe. And if you look closely among these cells, they don't have the lipid vacuoles, and you will see some multinucleated cells as well as some very large nuclei, which suggest that these cells are, are trying to divide and regenerate. So this liver, in spite of this massive insult, is trying to repair itself. Now when I looked at this, there was one other thing that didn't quite make a lot of sense. If we look at the areas of necrosis, there are a lot of fibroblasts, and that doesn't sound much like shock. Okay, it looks like this process might have gone on for a while, but there's extensive hemorrhage. So if we pop back over to check this out with our masons, you can see that this is not a case of acute heart failure where you would simply have necrosis but there's a tremendous amount of collagen that has been put down in the central lobular areas. So this animal has been fighting heart disease or heart failure for a long time, for at least days to weeks. And then we have the hemorrhage within these areas suggesting 
the terminal cardiovascular insufficiency. So this is a great case of an animal that has just been getting along for a while after this toxic dose of monensin. We have a combination of chronic changes in the liver due to heart failure, acute changes to the liver in central lobular areas due to terminal cardiac insufficiency, and then this massive fibrosis within the heart due to menensin toxicity. One thing I always find a little interesting, this is a section of the diaphragm, and that you can see right here throughout the diaphragm, the skeletal muscles, and the heart of this animal, here is a very large uh, apicomplexin Brady cyst, okay, probably due to Sarcocystis bovicanus. Unfortunately, this dose of menensin killed this animal, but didn't do anything for its coccidial parasites within the muscle. Well, I think it's a great case. These are some great lesions. I hope that you're as excited about this case as I am, and I look forward to presenting other interesting cases as they come across the desk. This is Bruce Williams signing off from the JPC. Have a great evening.